Welcome guys, gals, and non-binary pals to this week's episode of Buffy Boys, your weekly review of Buffy the Vampire Slayer from a queer, literary, and feminist perspective. My name is Joel, I'm one of your hosts, and with me as always is your other glorious host, Brian Hayes again. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Hi. To this end of season Buffy Boys extravaganza bonanza. Uh, yeah, that's, that's something we can call it. Um, how are you, Joel? Yeah, pretty good, excited. Uh, talk about this episode, uh, which is season five, episode 22, The Gift. Okay, yep. So, uh, this was written and directed by Joss Whedon, as you may have suspected. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was first aired on May 22nd, 2001. Um, here is your Buffy Ann summary. Determined that Dawn not die, Buffy demands that other ways to beat glory be found. At Ani's suggestion, they use the Buffy bot, the troll's hammer, the monk's glowing sphere, a wrecking ball. Um, Buffy, oh sorry, Willow sucks Tara's sanity back out of glory and the others help Buffy wear her down until she subsides back into Ben, whom Giles kills. Doc appears and starts, do- stop, starts Dawn bleeding. Uh, reality begins to crumble. Buffy realizes that Dawn's blood and hers are the same and sacrifices herself to save her sister. Um... Yeah, I suppose that's that's fine. Uh, I really like this episode. I really, really like it. I think it's great. And I think it's actually the... Oh, there will be no bronze banter for this episode because um, we don't have the time. Bronze, um, bronze is closed for explosions. Exactly. Oh, and you might hear a uh, washing machine in the background. It's um, it's it's washing bedclothes, if you, if you must know. Um, uh, they must. Uh, I think parasocial <clears throat> relationships have shown us that they must know these things. Yep. Um... But yeah, I I just think this is a really good se- season finale. I mm. think it's I think it's really up there. I mean, Buffy is so good when it comes to season finales. Like the one of the weakest one, the the obvious weakest one, season six. But like everything else is pretty much great, I'd say. And this episode is no exception, and it might be even exceptional within the exceptions. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so we're, we're obviously we're talking about the end of season five of Buffy. We're talking about Buffy defeating Glory, Buffy's second and ostensibly final, per, final death. Well, or the way it's presented, next very, to final death, very very much presented as such. And which I find significant, which I think massively informs the episode, is that it was originally positioned and framed as a series finale. Yeah, there's a, there's some complicated, messy stuff around mm. that. So there's elements of this episode, the writing, where essentially what happened was happening at the time was that, um, yep. So like you know, with the opening scene, you have Buffy fighting uh, just a standard vampire at the back of the um, the magic box. And Joss Whedon specifically wrote that scene in to commemorate kind of like a bit of a callback to early Buffy episodes because he thought there was a suggestion that this could be the last. Um, it's not clear at which point during the writing process, filming process, etc., that mm-hmm. it was that they knew that the show was going to continue because the WB were hoping to continue airing the show, um, but Joss Whedon had been snubbed by one of the Joss, one of the WB. Um, executives mm-hmm. at various points and was pretty pissed about that and UPN, UPN, UPN yeah. had offered them a significantly larger budget per episode something like 2.5 million or 1.7 whatever it was and um, so uh yeah this is the WB finale yeah and they will move to UPN and it was billed as a series finale by WB because <laughs> um because it was their series finale it's something which we've spoken briefly about before but if you actually like the er, that era of television um like really kind of the late 80s to the mid 2000s was kind of lawless in terms of how networks would present things and that particularly Mm -hmm. the promos for episodes the tv um spots and all that would just say whatever the network wanted to position as and you really no control over that yeah Um, so I think we see that um, very prominently and framed in this episode in terms of, as I said, the kind of the callback, the opening staking of a vampire and kind of showing how far she's come since season one and all that. Um, bizarrely, it is literally like in a, what seems to be like a self-contained alley at the back of the magic box. Yeah, it was, it's really odd when I don't think we ever see it again. No. Uh, and then the opening... Uh, Craig X or the previously on Buffy is uh, a scene from I can only assume every single episode of Buffy it, up until that is point. Yeah. specifically every episode of Buffy and I'll tell you how I know because uh, at the on IMDB one of the things I do is that you like I'll check all the when I'm doing my research I check all the trivia areas that could be, exist online or wherever I can think of and one of them is IMDB and you look at every single episode in IMDB it says oh this episode 
a clip also shown in The Gift. Mm-hmm. And it's because, uh, yeah, there's um, the previously on Buffy shows... Uh, Welcome to the Hellmouth kind of as the framing. Yeah, yeah, and all the characters introducing themselves. And then a, Angel. <laughs> a, a clip from every single episode of the show until it's incredibly short clips and they're flashing by and then you're in season five. Um, that that uh, piece of that previously on is featured on the, the Region 2 DVDs but not on the Region 1 DVDs, which is unusual. I think it's it's, it's, it's a shame, um, though apparently it's featured on the Season 7 DVDs as an Easter egg. Oh, very good. Yeah, I would say that's almost like a, a narrative piece for the episode. Oh, yeah. yeah. I, think it, I think it really informs the, the tone of the, yeah. the episode. Um, but, like, if you get into that kind of meta... meta uh, positioning of, um, of, of art and, you know, oh, well, this book was published with this... Uh, cover which really communicated this kind of tone does that like you know and the influence that has on the piece is that does that become part of the text it's 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 a big messy narrative yeah i think i think often there there's a lot of different schools of thought on that but i think joss whedon has quite clearly put his flag uh flag to the mast of that it is part of the story even so far as like putting tara in the credits in sure. season six and all that kind of stuff so he he has nogs nogs to that but yeah it's, it's a it's a very it's a very effective episode a setting of monumental tension in the sense of that yep. this is there's been many apocalypses before but this is potentially the last one that you know, this is you know she cannot be punched she cannot be staked she cannot potentially be stopped and that there's this decision that this cumulative, cumulative decision that Buffy has to make yeah um what's interesting as well is that I think this episode in terms of being a potential series finale also exhibits a lot of the writing threads that you'll see in the season seven finale mm-hmm. things like uh you know Anya dying in some rubble mm-hmm. <laughs> uh Buffy um being willing to sacrifice yourself uh, for the sake of uh, everyone that, that kind of like that band fighting or like, you know, the kind of like the group banding together to fight a, an unwinnable cause. Um, Willow, like stepping in with magic to save the day, stuff like this. Uh, all very, this episode feels like a proto version of, of Chosen, I think, mm-hmm. in a lot of ways. Um, and you know what I really like about this episode is that I think a lot of other season finales have really leaned on the fact that it was a two-parter, uh, seasons yeah. two and three mm-hmm. and four to some degree um and i think this really works as a one part <laughs> mm-hmm. i think it's very narratologically um is that a word that is a word it is yeah a very narratologically um structured you know there's no fluff in it whatsoever you and yet you fit in so much like you have at the beginning of the episode you have buffy um and don separated and buffy prepare making plans um which involves th- some extensive discussion of the morality of the of the situation you have um jaws kind of representing that kind of um utilitarian uh moral perspective where you want to maximize uh goodness or happiness mm. and that being the the moral imperative and you have buffy representing that kind of moral objectivist um i think a lot of our places call it um ontological mm. moral perspective um or deontological i can never remember anyway but um, where she thinks that like doing this wrong thing is wrong, mm-hmm. you know that, so, uh, i.e., killing either Don or Ben is so wrong that she will not even consider it. That it will that will not happen. Um, and yeah, the this, the conversations between Buffy and Giles really take a um, really take the main stage at the beginning, beginning of the episode. I think. Um, there's an absolutely heartbreaking interaction between Buffy and Giles where she kind of communicates that, you know, she had to kill Angel and she understood why she could, why she had to do that and she just patently refuses to, to do so with Dawn. I think that really speaks to the to the reason that Dawn was put in this show. You know, it really feels... Um, it feels like Buffy, the character who Buffy has become with Dawn in place here is better and wiser, more grown up, and just the Buffy that becomes the overall picture of Buffy that we have by the end of the show. Yeah. I think it's very important. No, I absolutely agree. And I, what I like a lot about those conversations with Giles is there's something about shows like this, probably about a lot of media, but something about shows like this, which often prompts people to be very surface level in their engagement with it. Mm-hmm. And I think we're all very familiar with you know, people who are fans of the show, but we like, well, you know, 
I'm intellectually superior because I figure out that she says that it's not okay if you don't, but she actually killed Angel in season two, that kind of thing. It's like, yeah, but that's not necessarily a mistake. And like it, people are informed and grow and change and things. It requires, that kind of perspective requires a, a really, I think, uninterrogated belief that there is an objectively right thing to do. or that, mm-hmm. And once you figure that out, it's like sort of slot, slot the square peg into a square hole. And with this, it's very much that, you know, I think be- between Angel, Dong and Ben, there's three people who have elements of innocence or elements of, um, of, of, of not being responsible for what's happened to them who could be killed to save the world. And they're all very different conversations. And they're different for each person involved. It would be entirely different for Xander to um, kill Ben or kill Angel compared to Buffy. And that is kind of incredibly, incredibly relevant as well. So I think with the show so rooted in the idea of uh, kind of addressing hierarchy patriarchy history and um, the responsibility of the slayer and framing those initial seasons and definitely particularly season one with giles being like you know i'm your watcher here's what you have to do here's the handbook etc and um, this is a kind of a full circle there in you know giles isn't necessarily wrong or he's not necessarily failing here but he is in a, a generation and a thought process that has to be superseded by what buffy wants to do you know yeah and i think in, uh, in another like also significant way he has to do this um and he knows buffy can't and i think you know someone i th- i think that's a very morally interesting perspective is that in situations where someone is morally taking stance that they cannot do something and other people see that it has to be done taking that onto yourself is um is important and i, I mean like there's the the show nearly wades into the waters of like you know moral angels and moral purity mm. um and it doesn't quite get there i think i think it's really muddied the waters up to this point in a really good way so i don't think it needs to go yeah. there but i think ultimately he's right buffy could never kill ben and um she could never kill dawn and she has to stop anyone who tries to kill dawn um and that dichotomy of giles being able to do it buffy not being able to do it and um the importance of it happening of killing ben of saving dawn is uh, like you know the tension there is everything that the show is trying to write about i think Mm -hmm. um it's really good really like it i that in that conversation where buffy is training to get ready for the fight and this is concurrent with a lot of scenes between uh dawn and um ben which i actually found really interesting because dawn at one point says i'm not talking to you bring back glory i don't want to talk to you and the idea is there that like Ben is human and his um, his rejection of what he should do and his selfishness is more disgusting to Don than the pure the pure straightforward uh, palatable evil that Glory represents. Yeah, um, and I think that I, I thought that was a great note. And then Glory communicates that like Buffy isn't coming to get you she she won't and don doesn't give up yeah no i think all that's very essential to this and i think the fact that you know you, you like morality is very much and appropriately framed the show as a human construct and not that it doesn't exist beyond that but just that there are certain you know elements of it for which you cannot expect a ung and soul vampire or a hell gog etc to have that same engagement with it and it's by framing the human choices as the most important aspect of the show rather than what exactly glory looks like when she's a demon that the show gets x kind of character mm-hmm. um, and i think some of the significant things there are you know don never gives up um not even hope but belief that buffy will do what she's meant to do for her mm-hmm. and what this show what this episode crystallizes which i think really pulls together the whole season is the idea that dong you know isn't just her sister by choice you know by having accepted the circumstance but that she is actually part of Buffy it makes the whole season and the whole interaction with Dong a reflection on, on Buffy as a person yeah and the you know where that summer's blog and that summer's women comes through with the fact that Dawn doesn't um falter on Buffy because she has that sense of um of belief and, and she's that. and she's learned from Buffy like mm-hmm. you know and I think uh skipping ahead a bit I think that's um I think that's most exemplified in Dawn at the end of the episode, fully without a second thought, being prepared to throw herself into the 
into the into the into the energy ball. I wish we had a better phrase for that. Mm. The portal. Um, the portal. The portal. The portal. Throw herself into the portal <laughs> without like yeah, without a second thought. She's she's yeah. ready to sacrifice herself for 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 what's happening, and she's learned that from Buffy. Um, and I but. Th- uh, I think as well, like, how old is Don here? 14 or whatever. Yeah, 14, 15. Uh, yeah, and the first time that Buffy had to die for the world was when she was 16. And so yeah. what Buffy gets to do here in some ways is to do for Don what no one was able to do for her when she was, you know, younger, yeah. you know? Yeah, and I've, I've a lot to think... I'll come back to that in a second because I have a lot to say about that. But um, the... Yeah, the, the the interaction that I just wanted to note there between Buffy and and and, and uh, Giles, which really got me like you know emotionally ready to just absolutely mm-hmm. weep at the end of the episode, which, which I did. did. Yeah, I I like embarrassing. I spent like five minutes crying afterwards, but like like laughing at my. You know when you're like very upset and you're like laughing at yourself, crying. Yeah, yeah I was doing that. It was it was very amusing. Anyway, uh, yeah, Buffy just says to to Giles at one point, "I wish my mom was here." Mm. and that is just heartbreaking and it really i think sets the i I think it's very important that the show remembers what has happened and it does and it it's narratively great and it was heartbreaking yeah anyway so mark field writes a lot about this episode obviously a lot of people a lot of people have done a lot of writing about this episode um this is one of the things about seasons I, i feel like seasons four and five and seven get very little critical attention um and season six gets a decent amount because there's lots and lots of spike content Mm -hmm. people really like writing about spike anyway so um he notes that basically that um the overall purpose of this season is that uh dawn very importantly is um is buffy you know she uh she represents buffy's childish child uh, her her humanity Mm -hmm. Um, in the way that like sh- ju- uh, that glory represents the potential killer in her or mm-hmm. the the um the, what the she fears force. yeah what she fears is being the monstrous mm-hmm. um and glory very importantly is what buffy would represent without any of her uh, humanity mm-hmm. um so when you get things like with dawn not quite believing that she exists still it's all to the background of buffy questioning and if, questioning if she has any humanity left um, if she has, if she's become too hard, and that's kind of happening at the same time while Dawn is going through that kind of existential crisis, and all that time, Glory is getting stronger and stronger. Mm-hmm. And I think what you see in the episode "The Weight of the World" is that Buffy has integrated her humanity. Her, her humanity is her like doubt and her uh, continued f- feeling, uh, uh, yeah, and her continued ability to like, feel emotions, which she of mm-hmm. course never lets go of, even for a second, and. I mean, realistically, what she's worried about in that situation, she's experiencing like trauma mm-hmm. on an ongoing basis. And uh, at this point, she recognizes that as being part of who she is. And her integration of that like, is very much representative of what, um, what uh, Ben can't do, what Glory can't do. They choose to engage in a different aspect of themselves. I, I, I think that's just like... It's great. Like I, mean, I think I, 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 when I was reading that by Mark Field, I was like, "There we go. That's like that's a wonderful interpretation of this season, Dawn's existence, Dawn's reflection in Buffy the character." I was like, "Yeah, no, Buffy, Dawn represents what Buffy is worried she has lost, mm-hmm. and yeah, she absolutely represents the childhood that Buffy couldn't have, and that the reason that Buffy exists and can do what she does is to protect that for other people." Um. Yeah, and it's, I, I think it's just, I think it's a great writing note. He also notes that um, the the Knights, uh, uh, the Knights... But Byzantium. I was going to say Knights of Byzantium, but I was like, no, that's too ridiculous. Uh, they want to separate the link between the key and Buffy, uh, from Buffy from her, her, her childish, her child, her humanity and her um, ability to integrate fully because they are like a patriarchal association mm. who um, see a, an integrated woman as a deep threat. Um. Yeah, and uh, yeah, there's no women, women whatsoever with the knights. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. Um, what I think is very, and he, he also notes that uh, at the beginning of the, um, of the season, uh, Buffy and in her interactions with Dracula, with the kind of the the interactions that set off this this whole existential crisis for her in motion, where she is worried that being a slayer is just being a killer. Mm-hmm. 
Um, she gets a conclusive answer in this episode, and we get a conclusive answer in this episode. Being a slayer is not being a killer. And the death of the death being her gift is not what... It doesn't represent what she can do and must do because her, like what she what she has to do is not kill things what she has to do is give herself to um the people around her and to protecting the people around her and yeah i think it's i think it's i just think that this season while it was messy at parts and slow and oddly paced at times i think it's really really well structured towards a conclusion mm-hmm. um i think it's clear concise and bizarre i don't think you can really i i think it's i think it's very easy to watch this show on a surface level and get to the end of season five and feel like that all made that all made sense and it felt really good narratively but i don't understand why Mm -hmm. and i think that the why of it is actually complicated but it's actually very clever and well done yeah, no, and I, I think something... I think people often have a, a, a slightly surface understanding of Buffy herself, and I think she's actually one of the protagonists who has the most textured and consistent internal life, because so many protagonists, <coughs> Angel, um, are just about kind of uh, angst and, like, mm-hmm. you know, self-doubt and, and, and kind of all that kind of stuff. But, like, Buffy has this this vibrancy, and it's something which I was actually speaking to about in a, about a different property, but it's, I think part of it is this association with you know blood and uh, and and blood is kind of the you know something associated both with death and uh, death and life and that there's a passion and a drive uh, and that she's always kind of on the on the on the edge of this um and i think what we see in in this episode is very much you know i think one of the key lines is where when giles is killing bang and he says buffy couldn't do this because she's a hero mm-hmm. and not every slayer is yep you know, uh, they have the, the potential for it, they have the opportunity for it, but as I think very crucially, and we always say that faith adds so much to the show in respect yeah, of that, so true. is that it's not a given, and nothing Buffy does is a given. They are choices she makes, and what she does is use her opportunity to amplify her own personal characteristics, and ultimately bring people together and protect people. And a lot of the, the thing is, a lot of the arguments that are made to her in the show i think are very compelling and very seductive where it's yep. like listen to the watchers council they've been doing this for twelve thousand years listen or you are all powerful and you can interrupt the situation and do like do your will the way faith does yeah exactly or you know um giles being her most trusted and paternal figure for so long saying you have to kill dong yep. because otherwise you will fail and we will all die including dong like that is uh, and he is so so rarely faltered in supporting her and being a source of uh, strong judgment if i was in her position i would find that incredibly compelling argument you know so i think it's her conviction uh, that makes her a hero it's not how she swings a, a hammer although that is pretty cool as well yeah know? and i think what i think what we need to also see is something that the show does does like touch on at times but does it sometimes delves into the opposite direction, which is the idea of the the demon at the heart of the Slayer power, um, or or the uh, that demon kind of threatens the ex- the moral existence of all Slayers, um, the ability to have this power, meaning that you have to, at some point, succumb to an evil or die or 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 whatnot, and I think what we've seen is that demon or no that's that's a lie and it's it's a lie told by the patriarchy in this sense for i mean these women but like as for a very perfect analogy to um the suggestion that women who become fully empowered in life are a uh, an aberration and a um like a disgust on on in society and, and that's a lie told to women to make sure that they don't fully explore their power. Um, ultimately, the Slayer, what what it means to be a vampire Slayer in this show is that you are stronger, you have better instincts, you're faster. You can't use a crossbow. You, you can't use a crossbow. Um, and that's it. You know, besides the power of flowing to other people after you've died. There's no other, there's no other implications. There's no other existential metaphysical awfulness to it beyond those things and the fact that buffy is terrified that there is is 
kind of put to bed in this episode. She There's no further... It, it, there isn't anything to her about being a slayer that isn't just those things and the rest is just her mm. and I've, all, I've often thought that in terms of you know we eventually characterize the slayer history as having this demon bound to them by the shadow man you mm-hmm. know to be used entirely as a weapon and as a tool and as something to be directed I've often thought that the ability that the slayers have prophetic visions and they share visions and have this like the dog is not as intended by the watchers yep. you know and that that's something transgressive which can't be controlled or interrupted and it is that urge to help and to share and to the sorority of it and you know the sense that to make something meaningful out of what was um oppressive oppressive exactly yeah i i i think that 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 is probably one of the other than being strong and being fast that is the other defining aspect is that kind of um shared history um it's like almost like an an extension and an extreme of something only being an oral history they don't even have the oral history because they can't meet each other so they have a psychic history together yeah absolutely and it's we'll talk about this so much in season seven Mm -hmm. because season seven I think is has a perfect metaphorical conclusion to this the the spreading of the very it's very marxist perspective the spreading of the the power to mm-hmm. other people the communication that um i'm stronger when you're stronger anyway it's great uh other moments that uh we were liking this episode i i i thought that anya and xander stuff was quite touching to mm-hmm. be honest i thought um i thought emma caulfield was great in it uh, I, I I I just and she's also in One Division at the moment, which is great. If you haven't been watching One Division and you like uh, Marvel t- movies, if you've say, liked a Marvel movie, I think yeah. Well, no, because it's so intertextual. It, it like it's definitely one of the best things Marvel has done, mm-hmm. but it so heavily relies on a knowledge of all the rest of everything that's happened, I and s- it just kind of falls a bit flat without. I suppose my uh, my my thinking there is just I kind of hate a little bit where we've gotten to with Marvel, where it's like. We, we we treat all MCU properties as if they're like if you like one you like the other because if you like mm-hmm. Daredevil you might not like Captain America if you like Captain America you, you wouldn't like Thor do you know it's not necessarily all this all, all connected but I think yeah as you're saying sorry that's a that's a digression but um one division is, is is definitely like an actual television show <laughs> yeah no it's quite good um so uh yeah I thought it was quite nice the interaction where basically uh, Xander um or Anya says like she's experiencing a genuine fear which is unusual for her. She's saying that she's scared of the apocalypse happening and Xander dying and Xander proposes to her and it's just a very touching, small moment. Um, it's really nice. And then that's followed by Willow having a moment with Tara where Tara, um, where Willow comes over to Tara and says, like, oh, like, you know, you're going to lead us to glory or whatever. And Tara, like, just full on slaps her. Mm-hmm. And um, Willow just, yeah, she says, like, you know, I'm going to get you back. And the Willow-Tara uh, storyline in this episode loved it um so tara wanders off into the streets to go find glory because um it's one of the many threads that they pull together to 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 to, to, towards a conclusion yeah which is just great tara Tara, like i mean it's so many weaknesses through the season they bring together as a strength yeah tara losing tara they use as a strength because they both use her to guide them to 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 glory in a way that makes total sense for Mm. the narrative and they uh glory taking advantage of tara Willow uses that to their advantage by reversing it, thereby getting Tara back and weakening Glory in a, at a great moment. Mm. They make a statement about this, right? Which I think you're absolutely right on. There is n- this is a this is a, a a masterclass because there is nothing about this conclu- conclusion which is a Deus Ex Machina. Yeah, and which uh, definitely happens in season three. Say, you know, mm. you have your or like season two. Okay, the uh, what is it the this Akatosh, what was it called? Pardon me, sorry. The 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 demon that was going to swallow everyone from season three. Season the, two. Um. Oh. Uh, oh gosh. Um. I know this. Whatever it is, that only arrives in in the a cathola. A cathola. That only arrives in the in the, the penultimate episode. Yeah. But but that's fine because it's not really about you know the, the demon doesn't matter it's just about the fact that angel wants to do it yeah, yeah but i just think it's really neat in this episode yeah. or like season three those explosives where they get those from yeah or stuff like that whereas in this episode and i love that i think that's the way you should write you should write for 
uh, effect, not necessarily for continuity. Yeah. <laughs> but this season, it pulls together so many threads in such a nice way. Um, where, yeah, and then you have, like, you know, your Olaf's hammer, a obvi- uh, very obvious one, the orb of... Um, te- te- Tesla? Oh, Tesla. No. Is that what it's called? Anyway, that orb. Um, no, sorry. It's sorry. Dagon Sphere. In this episode, it's the Dagon Sphere. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So they get that and all this stuff. And it all comes together so beautifully. Um, so you have Willow and Tara. Um, so Willow reverses it. Great moment. And then, yeah, when, when Tara wakes up, Willow's kind of, There's a really, like, a very touching interaction that got me crying and kind of I didn't stop after that point from the episode where Willow says to Tara, or Tara says, Willow, I was so lost. And Willow says, I will always find you. Mm-hmm. Um, and, I was, and then they hold hands to do the magic together. And it's a real call back to Hush. All the whole thing I found pretty great yeah it's 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 an excellent um ensemble conclusion because if you have your favorite characters and you're invested in the fact that they actually work together as a unit um and like we like the joke is made in the show that like xander is useless but really like you could easily end up with a show where buffy is the only one who does anything effective really yes um and i i can't i cannot really think of a show like this whose conclusion so clearly shows that without one of them, the plan would have come apart. Yeah. Um, and I think it's very important that Tara gets to have such a crucial contribution, not just incidentally, but, you know, by leading them there. But the fact that her getting her mind back is kind of like a rejection and a reversal of that. Uh, and also that she does get to have this full circle thing with Willow. But, you know, that Xander, even with his little wrecking ball moment and all that kind of stuff, um, it's... It's really elegant because Glory couldn't be beaten by one single action, but yep. she can't countenance the idea of there being a number of smaller cooks. It's yep. almost like it's almost like a fable in some way that it's has this Shakespearean quality. It's almost isn't it? Mm-hmm. No, it's really it's a really well choreographed scene. And it, it's it's a testament, I think. And, I, and I, again, if we want to follow the public service of kind of showing our work, when I say kind of Deus Ex Machina as an essentially a conclusion which is, um, it, it, it's taking on negative connotations. It's not yeah. necessarily meant to have negative connotations. People but, think it means unearned conclusion. Um, yeah. And what it actually means is a conclusion with a mechanism which is introduced for that conclusion. Yeah. So the, like, well, the term deus ex machina comes from Greek theatre, ancient Greek theatre, which is God from the machine. And it's essentially a God would, de- would descend from the rafters or from behind the set and kind of resolve the problems at the end of mm-hmm. the play. So it's a mechanism in a finale where out of nowhere, something just comes to resolve everything. And usually these days it's used to me in kind of an unsatisfying way. But there are times in which things can be done in a perfunctory way, which is effective. And I think what you're speaking about or what you spoke about in terms of uh, a castle and all that in a small ways in this episode with Doc up on the rafters yeah sure because Doc is there just to serve a purpose um, it could be anyone the writing is saying it doesn't it, it, someone will be there it could be anyone and then when he's no longer interesting he he's gone the, yeah I think I, 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 I totally agree and I think that really it's a great moment because it's you know it feels like well what is, is any of this worthwhile if just this if anything can get in the way and just fuck this whole thing up mm. and it's like yeah no it is that's that's the whole point of buffy is not that if you defeat glory then that's the end of the story yeah that rhymed and I, um, <laughs> it wasn't even timed but um and <laughs> it's a it's a great piece of television as well because as something I know because watching it was the set that they're operating on is small Mm. it's this small um, industrial box there's only a few people there it kind of you have like a student performance of like Jurassic Park there (laughs) I would watch that Um, but the writing and bear in mind we literally never see Glory do anything demonic no. You know, so the the writing convinces us that these two women fighting each other, one of whom is a vampire slayer and the other is a hell god, and it has action to it, mm-hmm. and it has such a clear, um, you know, or my D and D stories and many D and D stories could take uh, in, uh take instruction from this because it has a one really clear objective, which is get up the staircase. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. that that I would say that that set that action set piece rivals any in Buffy mm-hmm. that getting up that stairs in that unusual terror that's kind of an aberration in this kind of quiet California neighborhood represents industrialization um, <laughs> and probably like oil rigs I'd say specifically um, was probably the writing note here mm-hmm. but the um, getting up that stairs uh, that, that terror and Buffy like scrambling and doing uh, at every moment 
uh, like you know at every moment where she gets knocked back down by glory finding another route it's wonderful yeah. it's very dynamic it's really well choreographed and i would say it's it's up there for me alongside great buffy versus faith fights yeah in terms of the best throwdowns of the show I and mean, i think absolute shout out absolute credit to Anya being like hey we have like five things we can use we yeah. have this mythical sphere we, we've just kept in a box somewhere yeah we have this hammer exactly which apparently that there a lot of places note that um they don't use the phrase god or troll god in the original episode with olaf and apparently joss had written that in and it got removed at some point in the in the filming process mm -hmm. and he was quite annoyed about that because it worked into his, his season conclusion i'm fine with it personally yeah like i think again we just take the 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 note that it is a significant weapon that only yeah. buffy can use it's for this episode it's her excalibur kind of thing but yeah we have this that small captain america moment where only like she can easily pick up the the hammer that no one else could could hold you yeah know? yeah which which is nice also just weed and property obviously yeah yeah exactly um so yeah i think it comes together in a in a in a, in a, in a a really impressive way uh, and like dong even has her contribution and yep. like she she holds her ground she's very much part of the team in this and she's valued as part of the team um and then when we kind of you know come to the conclusion obviously giles's role i think inarguably is essential and actually killing glory yeah mm -hmm. i think i think the 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 imagery of giles on the ground kneel down quietly suff suffocating someone while buffy sacrifices herself i mean that's kind of like the, that tension is the entire that's the show that's the thing mm -hmm. it's so fucking good it's it's like contrasted scene to scene anyway i also i think we need to do a shout out here because oh shout out, that sounds ridiculous we need to give spike his um his, his, his juice. juice in this episode because his um contribution uh between genuinely so buffy at one point says like you're the, the other powerful person here you need to do whatever you can to save don at any cost basically and he takes that very seriously mm -hmm. and he the moment where he is getting knocked off the tower by doc um it's it's a genuine it's one of genuine pathos you can see yeah. that he cares deeply about don because she represents buffy's humanity and he doesn't just love buffy as a slayer he loves buffy's humanity for his for his sins and it's a genuine moment of he's done everything he can and he 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 he'll do more but he just gets robbed of the opportunity yeah and then james marshall's at the end of the episode weeping over buffy's body i like i believe it yeah it, it's one it's why it's why one of the reasons and one, one of the main motive is why people love spike so much is because it's just a very well acted role even if the writing isn't always something we would agree with and Great, i think yeah. even when they go back to the house and she invites him in casually because she's like it doesn't really matter anymore um and he says um I'll always be a monster, but you may, you treat me like a man and that means something. Like, mm. it's, a, it's a good line. It's a good sentiment, you know? Yeah. Um, but yeah, the, like, the... We'll have so much more to say about Spike, but I think the way in which oh, he... Oh, season six is Spike. He, Spike perf he apes and then performs, imitates, and eventually, um, through repetition, reaches a form of humanity um, without having the, um, the advantage of a soul, I think is an interesting conversation. It is interesting. It's messy, but I think it's interesting mm -hmm. for sure. Um, then I suppose the only thing left to talk about really is... Do you want to jump from there? Oh, God, stop. I like... It's my only, my only note of criticism, and it's, it's not real criticism, is I didn't need the flashbacks to previous episodes where she re where he she was told like you know that the conversation of my blood is your blood mm -hmm. and the monks made dawn for me i understand why they're useful and i think in many ways i can being in that writer's room i'm not sure that if i was there now and i was saying we don't need it i'm pretty sure i would be overpowered because yeah. it's just like you can't rely on the on the watcher to remember all points of I, that. I absolutely agree with you and I often think that but I also know that for every time I would say I don't need it I can think of a different show where it was like oh I actually didn't remember that yeah. <laughs> so I suppose you're kind of splitting down the middle for people watching as well you yeah. are you are so um, it but, also means you could watch this episode reasonably out of sequence and still get the significance of the moment I think is probably important as well that's a great that's a very important part as well for just TV um, at the time which mm. was so decentralised anyway Buffy sacrifices herself for Dawn. And um, within the context of the show, it's fully emotionally believable. Having watched this episode probably do like dozens of times, I would say, 
having watched the seasons after it a couple of quite a few times um i fully was just in the moment of buffy sacrifice herself and that's significant because there's no sense of oh i can come back from this or something can be done about this or anything it just feels like it feels final and the idea of like buffy the vampire slayer who like you know our hero the person we love like dying and sacrificing herself is heartbreaking and so well done and so well written and yeah it's just really good it's um it's an absolute frustration i felt now for a long time i mean first seen this episode of like just moved on a minute earlier because like she has her she just happens to bleed to a certain degree yeah 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 i suppose so i mean like but it's meant to be there it's like you know it's, it's so close yeah that I, I guess it was the same thing with angel soul where it's like it feels like it almost didn't have to happen but that's where the choice is yeah yeah i think the it's it's the it's, it's what happens is that there dawn's has been cut by doc her feet bleed and her, her, her blood bleeds down, down to her feet yeah, i think it's a weird her, image but yeah, yeah her, her blood is running down her, her her body and it runs to her feet and it drops down into the portal and this happens while they're walking away from mm-hmm. buffy having saved her and they turn around because there's a glow of the portal activating basically and then they have to struggle with what's going to happen next dawn try, goes to throw herself into the energy portal to close it and as you said without hesitation just runs yeah yep and buffy stops her and says we're not doing that basically and then has a realization that no i can if i sacrifice myself i can close it too and beautiful moment she sees the uh, sunrise coming up mm. which it w- i think is temporarily unusual for this episode i don't think the sun actually rises in the episode for a significant l- bit longer um and it's be- i think it's kind of like it's very much a she sees it yeah, yeah. exactly and she whispers it on. We don't hear it until she has actually died, but she says her speech, which is the hardest thing in the world is to live with it. So you need to live on, et cetera. And it's, it's great. And if you want to I'm talk getting, about, I'm getting emotional. I know. If you want to talk about this being paired and mirrored with chosen, you know, the end of this episode is her telling Don, uh, telling an aspect of herself, the hardest thing you'll ever do is live in the world. And that's the last scene of chosen is her being like, well, now I just have to do it. You yeah. Know? So there's, there's an absolute pairing there. Um, but yeah, it's very good. And you get a real sense of, peace from her of like mm-hmm. of, of having a because she's struggled with so much in lack of clarity about what to do and this is just like a crit- critical path this will do it. and she knows it you know and that you know i think is one of the reasons why you can do a season six and seven because she has to deal with coming back from that point because it is a point of completion a point a point of, of, of clarity um and that ending is like it's, it's only a few minutes you know again so many other tv shows will give us like 40 minutes fucking round her of every every person willie the bartender what he thought about buffy dying etc mm-hmm. but it's not it's just she dies they see it they know it's done and then you see her tombstone yeah know? and importantly like like i think you get the feelings like you know i want to hear see hear what dawn says about this etc and i think it's more powerful for having not shown that they show the the gang finding buffy's body um willow just like breaking down in tears and spike as well yeah and that's it you know and that's that's all it has to be really good joel that's enough of that let's go for a um dusting what other bits you have for me okay so a couple of good bits i think interesting from the episode one is um when you know they're talking about the blood ritual and Xander being like you know why can't it just be like a lymph fluid uh, ritual or stuff that like was that funny. it was funny also but um spike makes the point that it always comes back to blood and it has to be that blood which i think is quite interesting an interesting narrative point. You have some for you, Joe. Um, so uh, we noted earlier that this um, was potentially written as a series finale. The opening scene is supposed to be specifically a callback, given it's the hundredth episode. It's our hundredth episode of the show, which Ooh. is crazy. Uh, actually, it's our hundred and first. But um, and it's um, and yeah, that's why he wrote this scene at the beginning. Um, the outfit that Buffy's wearing and in, in this episode when she's fighting Glory is the same episode from uh, uh, from I will remember you. Would you believe? Mm. Are you glad? Cordelia wears it at one point as well. She does, yeah. Weirdly, yeah. Um, I feel satisfied by Glory's discussion in this episode of how the reason why she hasn't just put her fist through Buffy's heart is because a little bit of Ben, Ben's humanity kind of tweaks her to trade and blows with her. Mm. It's just enough for me to like, yeah, Glory is also about this tension with humanity. So like, because, you know, for me, I'm, I'm always like, why doesn't she just tear apart? Yeah. That kind of answers that question for me, I think. Um. I thought it was quite funny as well when they're in the basement and they discover the Buffy bot because what's happened on set there is um, Sarah Michelle Gellar <laughs> is staring at, standing in the corner and they just pull a rug off of her. Yeah, no, that's pretty good. Um, nice. Which is quite a funny image. Um, 
I think of all the characters I found that in this episode, Xander's in the weirdest spot because he doesn't really have a conclusion. You know, his conclusion was all kind of tied up in in Anya um, to a large degree. I also enjoy when Willa said, you know, when Buffy starts getting stressed, he's like, don't have another coma, okay? <laughs> <laughs> a couple of other things for you. Um, there's, uh, I've, I've heard this Buffy bit a million times about Anya at the end of the episode mm-hmm. that she's supposed to have died. Her character was supposed to have died in this episode, but her moving, her, Emma Caulfield moving a bunch and wriggling at the end of the episode is the reason that she get kept in. That was a joke that Joss Whedon made at some dinner in 2002. It's not the actual situation. Um, this is the final episode starring uh, Anthony Stewart Head. Future episodes will have um, will feature uh, will f- have Alison Hannigan um, as Willow. You know where it says Anthony Stewart Head as Giles, um, and future episodes uh, with him appearing in it, he will appear as a, a special guest, guest star. Um, though he does actually end up being in twenty two of the four, four episodes left, so it's kind of funny. Um, they mention uh, Buffy at one point asks how many apocalypses we've been through at this point. Joel says six. Um, those six are, or at least six, those six are uh, Prophecy Girl, Becoming Part 2, Zeppo, Graduation Day Part 2, Doomed, and Primeval. Which was Doomed? Doomed was the one where the three... The three witches. The three witches says, yeah. throw themselves into the hole in the Sunnydale uh, High School. That'd be a great trivia question. I think the one that people always forget, well, definitely Doomed, but also um, the Zeppo is one yeah. I always forget when I think back. It's a I. great one as well. Primeval, I don't. I, question, I have a question mark as to the apocalypse-ness of it, but I'll, I'll take it. Um, another Buffy bit, a couple other Buffy bits for you. Um, so uh, one of the things that Mark Field notes, and I thought it was a great thing that I hadn't read anywhere else, is that the reason that Doc is in on this and the reason that he figures out how to or where Don is and what's going on with it is that he is part serpent, um, as you can see with his um, reptilian tongue and his tongue tail. And, his tail. Yeah. and in previously in the season, they note that um, serpents and and canines have a better ability of detecting the key. So that's why you can uh, mm-hmm. ID um, uh, Don. Don as such. Um, I also appreciate uh, or enjoy, you know, uh, when Giles said that, you know, I've sworn to protect this sorry world and sometimes that means saying and doing what others can't and shouldn't have to. Because mm-hmm. I think both this and Angel at the moment have kind of, kind of crystallized this idea that protecting people isn't something that they've happened into. It's now become, it's vocational now, yeah. you know, yeah. and what they do is built around that. And I think that development is subtle, but it's very much frames um, the direction of the show. For sure. Um, okay. Fashion. Do you want to go move into fashion? Yeah, I think that the teen, quoted, quoted as teen, that the vamp um, attacks in the opening scene looks, is dressed basically like Xander. Yes, true. Um, uh, and, and has kind of a very, like, a high, uh, Sunnydale High School kind of appearance. We also see that um, Glory uh, and Buffy are obviously dressed kind of diametrically opposed to each other, I think, in this episode. Glory in kind of a very simple black outfit and, and Buffy in her, in her white um sacrifice top um but otherwise we see that uh, we get a lot of you know you give a lot of props to tara for doing this cumulative episode in her pajamas but they are witchy pajamas importantly they are witchy pajamas um and we get more kind of beating up messy spike which i enjoy mm-hmm. um one of the not issues with but one of the unfortunate visuals for this episode is for all this emotional stuff uh, dong is wearing that like awful sacrificial dress which yeah. is just like basically a curtain wrapped around her yeah that's so true um yeah yeah i think also to note is uh jaws looks good in the episode he's wearing more casual murdery kind of clothes as opposed to his kind of very stiff upper lip um waistcoats of the early seasons mm-hmm. i like late season uh, jo- uh anthony cedar head outfits and um, i yeah and i think i think my other note was just yeah buffy in her uh in her i will remember you ta- uh, clothes is quite nice um yeah i think i don't know if there are any order significant fashion notes Brian, do you want to give us the death count for this episode? Absolutely. Joel, this is the worst one yet. Um, unidentified vampire staked by Buffy. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of Glory's minions killed by Spike with a crossbow. One of Glory's minions killed by Giles with a sword. Merc thrown from the tower by Buffy. Ben suffocated by Giles. Glory died with Ben. Doc pushed off the tower by Buffy. And Buffy Summers killed by mystical energy and self-sacrifice. <laughs> killed by self-sacrifice rip <laughs> yeah oh god that hurts a lot of main characters died in this episode what's your rating joel for the episode yep um i would say um 10 out of 10 bgsm octopus demons yeah um which is a reference to something which i forgot to mention which is when the portal opens it's like lancing uh, alternate universe energy uh, changing the town the two the three significant changes it makes a dragon 
uh, an earthquake and turning what I think is the high school into some weird like pod where like these Hellraiser pod or whatever where all these things are crawling out eggs Um, it's very intense 10 out of 10 Um, so many reasons Um, I think it works immaculately I think it's a it works markedly as a single episode of television um, as you, we mentioned as you discussed it's very self-contained in its structure you know it's kind of it's complete mm-hmm. um, I think that the way it pulls together all the themes and it calls a shot in those opening two scenes yeah. pulls together all the themes not just of the season of the show and makes a point that it wants to end on um, I think a lot of television could learn from this and I think no matter how many times you're seeing it it's still incredibly effective I, I totally it was, it was, and it was fun it was a fun it was an adventure of yeah. an episode yeah. it made me a little sad that Joss Whedon wasn't more involved in the season overall to be honest mm-hmm. but yeah no I would give a 10 out of 10 absolutely uh, 10 out of 10 pleasure moments out of 10 uh, yeah I just loved it loved it so much I love this episode it's one of my absolute favourites if it's if it's not in my top 5 it's certainly in my top 10 um so yeah, love it. So do we want to um, talk about other Buffy things or do we want to talk about let's, Angel? Let's go through our, let's go through our season conclusion list stuff, listicles um, right now. Do we and want then to we'll do, do that Angel. Bef- we want to do Angel afterwards. Yeah, okay, I think so. It. We'll keep the Buffys together. Okay, Jill, do you have a season rating out of 10? And we go for, do we go for whole numbers with this? Yeah, let's go for whole numbers. I think for- we went for whole numbers slash 0.5s. If you want to go for 0.5s, that's fine. Okay, well, I'm not going to because okay. I go give this uh, ten out of ten, mommies. Joel, we were talking the other night, and you were giving it. You told me you gave it eight point five out of ten. Well, I changed my mind. I, I, I'm allowed to grow as a person, <laughs> as much as you often try to stop me. Uh, no, watching this episode and having to do the, the research and the thinking and all that kind of stuff around, I was uh, and looking at the episodes in the season. I was like, this is just incredibly strong. Mm-hmm. But and this is like a, such a cliche thing to say, but. I feel like I appreciate this season much more now that I'm a bit older than when I originally watched the show. Yeah, sure. Um, and I think that originally it was like, oh yeah, get that snake. I hate my principal too. Mm-hmm. Um, well, which actually I didn't. Um, but now I'm kind of like the the things it explores in this season, the way it, it does so many dangerous things like introducing a kick sister and all that. And the idea of whether the Slayer is more than just um, a weapon whether death it can be a two-sided thing and, and, and all that I, I think as an adult I'm kind of like I really think it's very well done and I think it exceeds a lot of interesting thoughts that I think mm-hmm. are actually potentially quite positive for people if they take anything from it so I kind of yeah I feel like yeah I'm going to give this 10 out of 10 fair I'm going to give it 9 out of 10 um, I think it's wonderful I think I gave season 3 9 out of 10 as well so I'm comfortable with that because I would say Hard season marker. I would say season, oh my, my oh, spoilers, but I think my overall ratings for the show go two, three, five, and those are interchangeable. Um, and then probably like four, one, six, seven, maybe? We'll see. Anyway. Uh, but imagine if you just dropped into the podcast at that exact moment, how fucking insane I would sound. I would sound like one of those number caller um, British like wartime. The shipping, the, the, those still happen, those like shipping transmissions. Yeah. I like see, yeah, 100%. 17. 32, 400, etc. Anyway, nine, uh, what did I, oh, I meant to say uh, Hell Gods out of 10. Nine Hell Gods out of 10. Really, really love it. I think it has um, pacing problems at times. I think it has writing blunders at times. I don't think this show, this season has in any way the lows of pre- previous seasons. I struggled to find a worst episode for this one. Um, well, no, I didn't. I no, it's a very, <laughs> it <was> a very, <laughs> very clear one. Yeah. But it even that was pretty good compared to a lot of uh, episodes of mm-hmm. other seasons. Um, I don't like the emphasis on Spike uh, in some ways in this season. I think it works better in season six and seven. But um, yeah, I, I re- it, at the same time, it is one of my favorite seasons of any TV show of all time. I If, if you're asking me in a non-Buffy context, episodes or season five of Buffy the Vampire Slayer what you give it a 10 I'd be like 10 out of 10 Compa- compared to the rest of the seasons where but season two is an absolute 10 and the others are compared to that um yeah I think this is a nine for me Joel what was your favorite episode so I think the you traitor what you're going for the gift no I'm not no I'm not okay, my, 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 my favorite episode is the body good um and there's not much more to say about the boggy. I think it is a episode. It is one of the best episodes of television that's ever been made. Agreed. Um, I think it transcends. Uh, I think um, it is it is historic of historical significance. 
Um, but it's also obvious. So I think uh, the things I was thinking of, like a body, I think has to be up there, S rank, 11 out of 10, etc. The gift, I think, as I said, is very, very good. Uh, but I tried to think of something as uh, just which we were talking about, which was not one of those. I actually think maybe Full for Love. I had that on my list too, yeah. Yeah, because I, I thought like it's a, it's a very good two-hander. It's two of the best actors on the show working together. And I think having Spike as a ultimately more interesting vampire character mm-hmm. than Angel was in his in his discussion and interrogation of what it means to be a vampire and how that's interplayed with the Slayers and also the device of him having killed two Slayers before and being able to explore that mm-hmm. um, brings to the narrative and the mythos stuff which I like which is this tension between the Slayer and the vampire and what that means I think it also yeah I, I agree um I'll, I'll go through mine briefly because I've, you've, I'll, I'll just be echoing what you just said. What I think is also very interesting about Feel for Love is the fact that its companion piece is Darla in Angel. And that as a two-hander is so good. You know, it's it's like an incredible night of TV, that, mm. that night of TV. And they're both really, really good episodes of what they are. They tie the two shows in together beautifully. Um, and uh, yeah, I think I think that's really interesting. Um, the other one I would highlight as being up there with me because I think the gift for me is a very close second, but at the same time, no way close at all. It was never going to be anything but the body for me mm. as the best episode of the season. But the other one I would highlight, along with Fool for Love, is Family, mm. which yeah. we absolutely loved. Um, it's kind of dodgy in some ways. The writing's not always great, uh, but it's significant to us and pretty wonderful. What was your least favourite episode of the season? My least favourite episode was Listening to Fear. Same. Yeah. Which, um, as you all clearly remember, it was the one where the um, Queller demon came on an asteroid from space and made everyone, or fed on all the mentally ill people, and then the army came and killed it or something, or took it away. Um, I, 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 yeah, it broke into an attack Joyce and stuff. It was, uh, it was just it stuck out because it, it didn't even seem like an episode of Buffy it was just it was yeah. like someone else's spec script had gotten um, commissioned for it how crazy is that even in that episode that you had that Buffy listening to Tango in the kitchen and crying while doing the dishes and that was a great moment yeah yeah but that scene could have been put into any episode really so true um, and then, aside from that I kind of had I thought into the woods um, yeah. with Riley leaving because for what is a significant moment in a TV show that was just an element of like, let's just get him out of here a yeah. bit to us, you know, and the running for the helicopter and him just not looking back. I'm kind of like, okay, whatever. Yeah. Goodbye, gotcha. Riley. <laughs> uh, who was your favorite character of the, of the season? This might be controversial. It might not be by this point. I'm going to say Dong. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Well, um, because that's a great shout. I had considered it, but I'm not going there. Like I could say Buffy every season. I <laughs> go on. <laughs> Which we can have that conversation in a second. Um, I'm going to say Don for season five because season five is obviously Don's season. Um, I think that it is an incredibly risky and potentially a jump the shark moment. I'm sure there are some people who think it's when the show jumped the shark. I'm like, no, you've actually really made, you've really double, double your risks, double your reward here by making this what the season is about and exploring all the interesting things it could mean. And I actually think that Michelle Trackenberg, Michelle Trackenberg does a great job. Great. Um, I think she brings something to the ensemble cast that wasn't there. Mm-hmm. Um, something which is worth having um so yeah i i just i just yeah i was i think if anything my favorite character not least for the season in in terms of what she brings to it but because i was so pleasantly surprised because i had this impression of like oh buffy the vampire slayer is good and sometimes there's this weird stuff with her sister i'm like yeah. no actually i'm kind of a Don fan now so my real answer is buffy yeah of course yeah. but what we're going to say i said today is uh joyce mm-hmm. because i think uh joyce the character had to be incredibly good to motivate the episode the body you know mm, that's a good point i think she was immaculately performed by christine sutherland over the over the seasons even when she wasn't in it very much i think it's a heartbreaking role i think this season um the wonderfulness of having her feel like she's getting her life back and taking it away absolutely tragic but very nice that she got to feel like she went out and high well she probably didn't feel like that she probably felt like she was uh, smelling toast um <laughs> But Brian. it's Joyce. Like, we hardly know you. Okay, who is your least favorite ep- character of the season? Ben. Oh, yeah, fair. Um, Because, again, I think it's almost a counterpoint to Dong in the sense of that, you know, obviously there's limited time for characters and stuff, but 
for the role he had, he could have been more interesting. Mm-hmm. I think, arguably, no offense, but he could have been maybe better acted as well. Like, yeah. it's just not my favorite performance. He even, felt, even though he's very pretty. Yeah, he felt like a character from season four. Do you know what I mean? I can see that. Um, and Especially I, with all the other actors doing such an amazing job this season. I think if you really want to, if there's one thing I could push this show, this season, over the top, it would be if the question of whether or not to kill Ben and his betrayal was something I don't I do not care that Giles killed Ben if he was in some way likable or at yeah. least complex and um, then that would just add an extra thing to it so I feel he falls really flat for me you know I agree I, I definitely agree my least favorite character of the season though I thought we were gonna I, this was the one that I was like oh this is gonna be, we're gonna have the same worth for this R- Riley yeah like at, at a push I'd be like oh yeah Riley was in this season you know it's not who I think about when I think about season 5 um, um, he, he I have to agree with you on that he is um, rudder, rudderless as a character yeah. in this and I think that the demon the vampire brothel stuff is some of the most like trite writing the show ever does I yeah. totally agree and I think I, it's his fault <laughs> it is his fault um, as a character he's rudderless he doubles back on a lot of the qualities he had in season 4 mm. to become a unsupportive blamey shitty guy and i'm glad he's gone and i think kind of out of character as well but yeah you know, and not just doubling back but like <clears throat> he has certain intrinsic characteristics mm-hmm. which i think that that doesn't support even yeah. after he gets unchipped yeah, yeah the reason that he was in, he loved he liked buffy is that she was complex messy mm-hmm. and real and dealing with things yeah and in this season her mother gets a brain tumor and he's like play pay more attention to me mm-hmm. basically whatever uh who was your favorite bit character i, well, I went with jinx oh yeah because well, I, I think we have this thing every season where like what do we consider a big character you know mm-hmm. what? but i went with jinx because i uh i'm jinx maybe representative of all the scab scab demons but um they were funny uh they were a, a, a you know glory needed someone to talk to in yep. those scenes could have been so much worse as well could have been so much worse uh and just consistently i i, I kind of just found them an enjoyable an enjoyable addition didn't need any explanation kind of people who you could morally kill you know yeah. they had such they were so Expendable. such a utility in, in the script there's yeah. so many of them as well like yeah. they, there was like a rotating cast of them um my favorite bit character was definitely april loved her um i yeah that's interesting what go on no. I, I, I loved her I thought she was, I, I, yeah I can think she's great too uh, I thought she was great I thought the 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 depth she brought to that episode that episode was like it's such a standout one for me for the season April uh, being the original um, like sex robot that, yeah um, you know, I, was, I was made to love you um, which really great episode one that I definitely rediscovered on this rewatch of this season mm-hmm. um, thought she brought a lot of depth a lot of pathos um, we liked her did you have her written then as well no Okay, I thought you were. No, I think she was a great bit character. He was your least favorite bit character, Joel. I remember Olaf. Yeah, fair enough, yeah. Because um, it, Olaf is a kind of Joss Whedon character, which we've seen a lot of on Angel recently, and it's a, it's a broad level of comedy, which is just like, I'm not going to criticize it, it's just not to my taste. It's like, yeah. yes, he's a troll, he says things about wenches, he has a big hammer, he occasionally says anachronistic things that people might say in the 20th. I get it, you know, it's just, it's not, I'm not, it's not getting me out of bed. Um, so I so like I don't I did, I wasn't particularly interested in him while he was there. Um I th- I think I think a lot of the other big characters were particularly bad in the yeah. season to be honest. Yeah, I started for this too. I put down uh, Knights of Byzantium just all of them because I didn't care about any single one of them at any point. I think yeah, I would consider that because I didn't care about any of them individually and I decided that they did something useful for the story, but like who cares about Gregor? Yeah, yeah exactly. Okay, um what's your favorite outfit of the season? Favorite outfit was not one of the things you asked me. It absolutely was. I don't believe so. It's on the list of the photo I sent you. Oh, I don't think so. It's fine. We'll, we'll barrel on ahead. Um, it's I, I, Joel, we, the reason that we keep doing fashion is because of a joke we made in the first episodes of the show. We know nothing about fashion. We should not be talking about it anymore. Okay. Uh, I'm going to... I'm going to I'm go, I'm go, I'm go, uh, go for it. Yeah, go for it. I'm going to say what my favorite outfit of the season is. Um, I'm going to say Tara's pajamas. Great. Because, Just so happens to be in this episode. No, Shopping. I think a number of episodes... It's because I heard that great interview with Amber Benson where she said it was great that she got to wear her pajamas around set for a number of episodes. Um, and I also actually think it's quite memorable. I think like you really associate that kind of weirdly vulnerable period of season five with Tara kind of being, um, having to take to have so much care taken over. So that's what I'm going to put for, for best day of it. Great. Well, I'm going to go with Buffy in the Desert, um, which I just, she was wearing so many layers of like heavy clothing to go on a desert trip. Um, hilarious. Love it. What is your least favorite uh, outfit for the season? I am going to go for Xander's haircut in the first half of the yeah, season. Yeah, so bad. Um, 
I know we 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 bully Mister Harris quite a bit, but it's it's just very un, unflattering um, and very unnecessary because he's perfectly capable of being. I I do like this arc where he becomes a a tradesman and becomes more competent and has his own business and all kind of stuff. I I I like that for him, but the early season it's just like oh you know you kind of you want to take him aside a little bit yeah you really do um okay mine was uh just ben whenever he got had to wear glory gl- gl- wear glory's clothes because it brought me out of it every single time <laughs> yeah. i was like he would stretch the shit out of that yeah, very good. and he, he just looks bad in them because they're, yeah. they're, they're they're not women's clothes that would suit him um okay who is the best monster april uh, okay, okay yeah go ahead. so april was for me because she is the monster of that episode or oh, no, arguably warren is the monster but, um she's she's the non-human kind of thing in the episode and yeah i think she um was both threatening and also like so narratively complex and yeah. like it's rare that the show has a monster uh of the week that like, it's a victim you okay. know so often they're like i love that in the early shows are often they're kind of victims of their own hubris or something but this is just like it's not her fault yeah, yeah no it fully <laughs> isn't um i had the vampire in the body because i just love what the vampire represents i love what it does for that episode i love everything about that and he's kind of he's specifically gross grosser than most mm. vampires he's like wrinkly and weird um i really like it and also i think it's important to highlight a vampire in the show about yeah. vampire slaying uh, and what I love about that vampire as well is that my memory of the body was always that, like the vampire was thrown in because oh they you know maybe like the network said you couldn't have an episode without a monster and it's actually as we say it really helps the episode I think so too yeah, yeah. I think it's a very important note for it and who was your least favorite monster you know, the, the same one the Queller, Queller Demon, Demon yeah. listening to fear um, um, just uninteresting and Ultra gross uninteresting. and like you know inexplicable I always really I just I know this show is not about the lore i really resented this sudden injection that maybe demons came from space as well (laughs) like honestly (laughs) okay uh that's great that's season five a wrap of buffy high five Um, yeah we're staying really far away so we're not gonna do that but well done us Uh, season six is gonna be next week Let's very quickly run through the Cordelia Chase and we'll do our best uh, for Angel at the end of that. Yeah. So this week on uh, the Cordelia Chase where you have the episode There's No Place Like No Place Like Plix Group um, which is about... You take away too much joy in saying <laughs> that every time, gone. Uh, which is when they conclude their arc in Pilea and come back to Los Angeles. Um, it's fine. It's good. It's, it, 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 Would you it, say good? Yeah. Like if I've said the other two were fine, this is fine as well. Yeah. We have the racket intention that there's a device that blows up all the humans' heads and they kind of make a, a kind of a resistance around it. Um, he has a, Angel has a duel, a showdown with Gru, the Grusalug uh, for Cordelia. Um, and we have kind of the interesting elements of, it, I suppose, are around whether Angel can resist the or fight without the vampire resist the vampire integrate the vampire if he goes to become the vampire demon can he come back etc i know you don't like the demon itself but the idea of it is interesting and um, the, the fred while she's gone all the way into texas um her fear and her evident intelligence and her ability to bring them back um i think it's really a really good starting point for that um and i think that there is um a good evidence of how Gong and Wesley have grown to work together. Wesley has got more of a leadership skills that are kind of chafing against Angel being this designated champion. Um, and then they kind of, I think, wrap it up reasonably neatly and come back and have no reason to to go there again. Mm. Um, but p- probably one of the most um, poignant parts of the episode is when they come back to the Hyperion Hotel. They're all happy. They feel like they finally, after a difficult season, got the gang back together. Angel's in high spirits. He comes in and he sees Willow sitting in the lobby. I was like, hey, Willow, why are you here? And then it's like, why are you here? And then it's very obvious that Buffy has and to... And Angel says that it's Buffy. Yeah, Buffy's died. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah heartbreaking. I think, I think by comparison to what you said about Phil for Love and Darla, watching the gift and then watching this episode would be a complete jackknife turn yeah. tonally. So. Totally agree. That scene at the end of the episode is the only thing that stops it from being a 4 out of 10 um, uh, fail feminist gestures for me. It's bizarre and bad, I think, by this point. I think the other two episodes I was enjoying So what would you rate it then if it's not 4? 5. 5. Yeah, so... I'll say I, 6. Grant. Um, I thought this... It was grand and enjoyable, but like as a season finale, bizarre... Um, just doesn't have any weight to it whatsoever uh and this whole plot has outstayed its welcome like to a large degree three episodes is probably too many it is far too many i do not care at all um and the injection of these tolkien-esque 
uh, monsters or and like you know races and stuff. Awful, just badly done. I oh, do not, I didn't like it. And let's not forget that um, Lauren can have his head cut off and he's just fine. Yeah, four out of ten. Uh, boosted up to five out of ten because of Willow's appearance, um, and she doesn't even fucking say anything. So, yeah, um, there we go. Do you want anything else to say about that? It annoyed me, Joel. It annoyed me, okay? Yeah, you're on your Switch, so. Whatever. What was the best Angel episode of the season? Well, we say worst first, so we can yeah, I sure. know how you know. Worst episode was Happy Anniversary, which I was... I think Blood Money. Go on. Um, Blood Money was pretty bad as well. Happy Anniversary, I think, is a, a kind of irredeemable as an episode, or ha- has no redeeming value. It's the one where the scientist wants to stop time and trap his uh, now ex-girlfriend uh, in the moment of orgasm. Mm-hmm. Uh, it is gross. It is weird. Uh, it, the sh- it, it, lore-wise, narratively, it doesn't make any sense. Mm-hmm. Um, but also, it mixed the cardinal sin that a couple of episodes across the Buffy verse have done, which is like the, uh, the the narrative doesn't reprimand him nearly enough for like the really really sociopathic behavior and misogynistic behavior in the episode. They're just like it's an, epi- an aspect of oh you rascal don't do this again it's like no like 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 it hurt him yeah yeah <laughs> so i don't like that episode yeah me too i didn't like it either um i picked blood money there were many potential choices uh i this season's so weird because i think it, it, ha- it got its writing the wrong way around like the darla stuff should have been at the end of the season in, in in fairness so blood money was the episode where um Anne. Well, mm-hmm. Lily, Lily, um, is back and she's running well, she's the shelter. She's now. Yeah, yeah, and she's running the shelter and she, uh, there's money and there's blood on it. <laughs> yeah, and Angel does it for the wrong reasons and it's nothing. It's a bunch he, of nothing. He 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 sets up their auction to embarrass. He sets up a charity auction to embarrass Wolfram and Hart, but in a way that isn't really that embarrassing, and a way in which they, should, they actually would have been more hurt if they had just gone ahead with it. So it's yeah. all very confused. It's just that. Um, uh, so, yeah, that's my least favorite episode of the season. I think overall for the season, I'd probably give it like a generous six. Because the highlights were great. Mm. The rest of it was nothing. Uh, and favorite episode? Favorite episode. Um, my favorite episode of the season was... What did you say? Did you say your favorite episode? Not yet. No, you oh, just okay. went straight to the rating. So I was about to gently segue. So my favorite episode of the season was Darla. Great. Yeah. Um, I think Darla, as you say, a great two-hander with Fool for Love. I think that, uh, as I said at the time, um, Julie Benz, uh, her uh, performance and her taking a character which didn't have a lot of meat on the bottom and making something of it um, is not only great and she does a great job, but she adds something... Um, very crucial to the whole Buffy mythos and really complicates uh, the idea of the vampire and I think she she makes people make scenes better when she's in them so like I like that a lot um, and yeah, for me overall I'd say maybe maybe a 7 for the season yeah. I, I, on the on this is obviously on the angel scale yeah yeah I'm going to give uh, my favourite episode to Are You Never or Have You Ever Been because I just realised that episode the conclusion of it is absolutely bizarre with the, the weird demon but I think it was I think it's dark and twisty and cool and I think um, uh, I think Dave Boreanaz looks great in it he does look great it's very true so there we go whew that took a while yeah the, gi- the gift to us is now to be finished yeah the gift for me is to have to go off and edit this mm-hmm. um but you know great season yeah. um enjoy it enjoyable experience watching and uh criticizing it with you and, and sharing it with people who listen um and yeah i'm happy i got a hundred a uh, hundred episodes of buffy boys plus one mm. as well which we also did which was nice um big achievement i mean not not too bad not too bad altogether yeah not bad at all um okay there we go so folks, that's uh, it for us for season five of Buffy. We will be back next week with the start of season six. Um, if you enjoyed this episode, as always, please let us know and tell your friends and tell your vampire slayers oh. uh, to listen to Buffy Boys. And we will see you there. Thank you. See ya. See ya. <laughs>